Oh, wait, last question. You can't yeah. see my chat box, right? On my screen? No. Okay. <laughs> God, I should have gotten the hang of Zoom by now, but I don't know. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, we are live now. Um, hi, web shadowers. Thank you all for joining our session today. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Delator, who will be teaching us about gastroenterology. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video at the very end of the session. With that being said, Dr. Delator, you can get started whenever you're ready. Hi guys, how are you? I'm Rabia Delator. I'm a gastroenterologist and therapeutic endoscopist. And today I'm going to be talking about my career, how I got here, and then teach you, teaching you guys some interesting stuff about GI. And then at the end, we'll open it up to questions if that's okay with you all. And if anyone has any questions in the meantime, our lovely host is gonna just pop them up in my chat box so I can try to answer them if anything comes up that's more um, pressing and you want it to be answered right away. All right, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about me, not too much, I promise, <laughs> in terms of how I got to where I am today. Um, I was born in Toronto. I grew up mostly in Buffalo, New York. I went to Cornell University for undergrad, and then I got my MD and my medical degree at Stony Brook University School of Medicine. As an undergrad at Cornell, I majored in biological sciences and developmental sociology. And here are just some pictures of my friend and I at med school graduation, my white coat ceremony when I was a first year medical student. Um, and this is my family. And then here are the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> For those of you from Buffalo, <laughs> you understand our pain this year. Um, okay, in terms of training, I, after graduating from medical school at Stony Brook, I did my internal medicine residency at NYU for three years. Then I was accepted into the gastroenterology fellowship at the same institution at like the main campus of NYU for another three years. And then I just wanted the torture to continue. So I did an additional fellowship an advanced endoscopy, which was a, one additional year. So a total of seven years post medical school training. And then I became an attending and stayed on as faculty at NYU. Um, this was our match day ceremony. My best friend and I matched at our top choices. This is my first day of residency and this is my first day of fellowship. All right, in terms of how it's going now, I'm an assistant professor of medicine at NYU. So I stayed on where I trained. Um, which has its pluses and minuses, which we can talk about later. And I'm the director of endoscopy at Bellevue Hospital Center, which is one of the affiliate NYU uh, hospitals. And it's the oldest public hospital in the country and really an awesome place to work. I'm an academic institution attending, meaning I work with students and residents and fellows, and I absolutely love teaching. So that was something that was important to me as a trainee. And so I knew I wanted to go into academic medicine for that reason. All right, so before I start, I'm gonna go over a lot of things um, about my training and you know how I got here and, and just like things to try to like show you about my life and you know GI in general. I just wanna really point out that there is a stark contrast between what you guys see in presentations like these and the actual struggle. I have been where you are at every single step. I've struggled, it was very hard to get here, but it's hard for everyone. And if it was easy, everybody would just do it, right? So there's a reason why it's so difficult um, to weed out people that it's not really meant for. So just know that throughout all these processes, I struggled just like you, and this is a very hard path. And it's really, really, really kudos to you for going through it and make sure that you just like persevere and push through, but it's not a walk in the park for anyone. In fact, this bottom right-hand picture is my 28th birthday. I would have loved to have spent it with my family, but instead I spent it in the ICU on a 27 hour shift, which with a bunch of nurses who got me a Domino's pizza and a Domino's brownie cake. So, you know, like we all have to make sacrifices and it's really hard. So I just wanted to point that out there that by no means am I just trying to present you all like the glory days. Like there's been a lot of struggle in between too. All right. So that aside, let's talk about why gastroenterology. So for me, gastroenterology was the ideal field for many different reasons. It is procedure-based, and so if you like working with your hands, it's a great field for you. There is a wide variety of pathology, anything from medical oncology, focusing on colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, to you know inflammatory bowel disease, like autoimmune diseases, and everything in between. You can do liver, you can do pancreas. Um, there's just so many different types of pathology. So you know if one doesn't interest you, there's always a different kind within the subspecialty of gastroenterology. 
it has a competitive salary. So, you know, we all kind of struggle through being students for a very long time and then being underpaid trainees. And that's the reality of it. So if money is important to you and there's no shame in your game, if that is, and you're also interested in the type of pathology you'll see in GI, gastroenterology is a great field because it has a very competitive salary because it's procedure based mostly. Um, there's a lot of problem solving and fixing specifically in advanced endoscopy that I really enjoy. Um, some people like fields where you focus on chronic illness and there may not be a solution for it, but you know, you kind of stay with the patients for a long term and help them through that. I know myself enough to know that that wasn't a right field for me. I love seeing a problem and fixing it and then being able to like have that resolution, not only for the patient, but also for myself, because it's nice to be able to like say this is done and I help this patient or fix this problem. So for me, gastroenterology was very ideal for that reason. Like a gastrointestinal bleed, you can fix it and stop it from bleeding and move on. There are varying phenotypes of what GI looks like. You can be a private practice, you know, doctor in a big city or an academic doctor in a big city. You can have a hybrid. There's so many different things. You can be someone who scopes all the time, someone who never scopes. There's a lot of phenotypes for GI. So it's not a one size fits all type of job, you know, and you can learn with time as you grow within your own field, what you like and don't like and try to cater to yourself. And then you can choose both academic and private. Some special, some subspecialties don't do that well in private practice. Gastroenterology does amazing in private practice. So again, it's, it's one of those fields where you can do both. So that's another reason why it's very appealing to people. So what do I do? I, I trained obviously in general gastroenterology, so I can do upper endoscopy, which is an evaluation of the upper GI tract and colonoscopy, which is an evaluation of the colon. And then I also do advanced endoscopy. So that extra training year I did after gastroenterology fellowship allowed me to do a large amount of procedures that I wouldn't have been able to do had I not done that extra year. So I'll go into detail about what these procedures actually are, but I do ERCPs, which is basically instrumentation and interventions in the bile duct, which is an offshoot of the small intestine that drains the liver into the small intestine, um, cholangioscopy, which is scoping within the bile duct, endoscopic ultrasound, which is basically doing ultrasound from within the lumen of the GI tract to look at organs surrounding the GI tract and doing biopsies of them or interventions upon them, which I'll talk about. I do bariatric endoscopy as well, which is endoscopic weight loss. So for people who have surgery to reduce their stomach size, I can actually do an endoscopy so they don't have to have a surgery and reduce the size of their stomach or other interventions to basically help them lose weight endoscopically. So it's minimally invasive. I also do luminal stenting, which is stenting within the GI tract for mostly cancers and sometimes strictures. So a colon cancer, for example, that's obstructing and, and the patient is not a surgical candidate, they may need a stent and I can place a stent across it to open them up again. I do complex polypectomy, which is taking out very large polyps from the colon and, uh, you know, precancerous polyps, obviously that, um, 50, 20 years ago would have gone to surgery. We can now take them out endoscopically. And I also do uh, endoscopy of the small intestine, which is called enteroscopy. All right, so I'm going to go over these procedures so that, um, oh, someone asked a question. Let's see. What does the upper GI tract include? Oh my God, what a good question. That's exactly what I'm going to go over right now. <laughs> so when I say I do upper endoscopy and it's an evaluation of the upper GI tract, that is defined as the esophagus, which is obviously your swallowing tube right here, your stomach, which is right here, and the first part of your small intestine, which is called the duodenum. And the duodenum itself actually has four parts. And we usually go up to the second portion, or D2 we call it. So the second portion of the duodenum, the third and fourth part of the duodenum, you can usually read reach with your upper endoscope, but it's not part of the standard exam. So this is a picture of the esophagus. This is what the stomach looks like. And this is what the small intestine, the duodenum looks like. Um, and so I've just spent like so many hours of my life inside these areas of the human body. It feels like home to me. <laughs> All right. So next, let's see. Colonoscopy. So colonoscopy is a slightly thicker flexible tube that we insert into the rectum down here. And then we evaluate the entire colon, which also has segments, just like any part of the GI tract. So you have your rectum, then you have your sigmoid colon, which is this sigmoid shape right here. Then you have your descending colon, your transverse colon, and then you lastly have your ascending colon and then your cecum, which connects to the small intestine. And the main job of the colon obviously is to manage water balance and form stool. So, um, 
this, the colonoscopy, like I mentioned, evaluates all of these areas and we're able to basically reach the last part of the small intestine, which is called the ileum with this uh, colonoscope that's long enough to evaluate that. And here's a picture of what the transverse colon looks like. And a lot of people say you can identify it just by the triangle, so triangle transverse. All right. And the next procedure that I do as an advanced endoscopist is endoscopic ultrasound. So it's a similar scope to the one that you use in the upper endoscopy, but it has an ultrasound probe at the end of it, which connects to a monitor that allows us to see ultrasound images. So a lot of people are familiar with ultrasound because of transabdominal ultrasound or echocardiograms, ultrasounds of the heart. But a endoscopic ultrasound, again, is basically this probe inside pressing up against the wall of the GI lumen to look at surrounding organs. So for example, from the stomach, I can evaluate what the pancreas looks like and look for abnormalities. I can evaluate uh, a lot of the biliary tree, which I'm going to talk about that anatomy in a little bit. I can look at the gallbladder. I can look at the adrenal glands, the kidneys, the spleen. I can see almost really most of the abdominal organs from up in the stomach and also the first part of the small intestine. From the esophagus, I can also see, you know, surrounding organs, but we are not obviously doing an ultrasounds of the heart. Those are, that's what the cardiologists do. So we usually leave those thoracic organs to other subspecialties, but the endoscopic ultrasound allows us to see pretty much anything outside of the GI lumen, which is really nice because if you have a tumor, for example, in the pancreas and you need to biopsy it to get a diagnosis for the patient so they can start treatment, you know, before endoscopic ultrasound was a thing, people were getting percutaneous biopsies, which really hurts. And it's going through the skin, obviously. This is a painless procedure and it's, again, minimally invasive. So the patient goes to sleep, you do the endoscopy, the endoscopic ultrasound, whatever intervention you want to do, and then they wake up and they don't really feel anything. This here is a picture of a needle going into a tumor and tumors usually are hypoechoic or a little bit darker. Um, this ultrasound picture here is basically a picture of the common bile duct and vasculature next to it. And within the common bile duct, you can't really make it out too well in this picture, but there's some sludge or some debris that's in there and then a big stone and stones tend to shatter and that's how we can tell stones are there. So that's a common bile duct stone. I also do interventional EUS. So I can take my ultrasound probe and I can basically use it to guide me to stent things through the stomach wall. So one of the disease processes that I manage is pancreatitis, which is an inflammation of the pancreas. And after people get very severe pancreatitis, they can form these big fluid collections that just kind of form a rind and just sit in the belly. And you don't always have to intervene upon them or drain them, but sometimes they can get infected and there's pus and sometimes they cause pain pain and sometimes they can basically cause compression of the GI tract and cause patient to have an obstruction. In those cases, you have to drain them. So historically people had percutaneous drains or the surgeons went in and drain these and kind of like scoop them out almost. But those are, again, patients have to sit with a bag coming out of their belly and it's very uncomfortable for them. So within GI, within advanced endoscopy, we've actually found a way to use endoscopic ultrasound to internally drain it so that it just basically yeah. comes out into the stomach. So here is a picture of an endoscopic ultrasound I did. Uh, to drain a big collection into the stomach. And you can see how much pus is there. Um, I'm going to show it to you guys one more time because it's such a cool procedure, not for the faint of heart. Um, but you can see like this, there was a big collection. I put this stent that looks like kind of like a dumbbell through the stomach wall into the collection and it drained over a half liter of pus right away. And I have to tell you, the patient woke up feeling amazing. And then the stent comes out within usually about a month and you get imaging obviously to confirm that this collection has gone away. And it's just a very, very, very awesome procedure, not only for the patient, but also for me, because you've, you've done a huge intervention for this person without them having to have a surgery or living with a bag hanging outside of their tummy for months and months, you know, and it's really nice feeling to be able to do that for someone. All right. Another option uh, for EUS intervention is EUS gu guided gallbladder drainage. So there's uh, the gallbladder is here. It comes off of the bile duct and sometimes it gets really sick and infected. And like any pocket of pus anywhere in the body, you have to drain it. Infections must be drained if they form like a fluid collection of some sort, or else they'll just kind of get worse and fester and the patient can get really sick. So just like the one I just showed you that was infected and I had to drain that pus through the stomach. If you have an infected gallbladder and the patient's too sick or too old or not a surgical candidate to get their gallbladder removed by a surgeon, you can do the same thing with that same type of stent and basically put a stent through the wall of the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine into the gallbladder and drain it. And this is what it looks like on ultrasound. When you 
you find your needle, you go into this collection. This was a gallbladder and you deploy this stent first like this, then you slowly back your scope up and then it pops into the stomach. So one side is in the small intestine and one side is in your collection, whether it's a gallbladder or whatever you're draining. All right. So the next big sort of issue I deal with are stones, stones in the gallbladder, anywhere in the biliary tree. So before I really talk about those, I want to talk about the anatomy of the biliary tree. Oh, wait, hold on. Someone else asked a question. What causes a pus collection? So it's different for a gallbladder, infected gallbladder, the pus collection is caused just by infection within the gallbladder that festers and forms pus. For the peripancreatic collection that, uh, that develops after pancreatitis, if it gets super infected for whatever reason, like a tiny bit of bacteria enter this, this area, it can just explode with pus. And this is what it looks like when it gets super infected. I can watch that video like a thousand times. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the anatomy of the biliary tree. So just for reference, the stomach is here. And this is a duodenum, which I showed you guys in the other picture. The duodenum has this first portion, which is called the bulb, second portion, which is where the biliary tree comes in, third, and then fourth, and ends at what's called the ligament of trites. And then you have the next part of the small intestine, which is called the jejunum. So the biliary tree itself has many portions, which are important to understand. This right here is called the common bile duct. It is uh, external from the liver and it's basically just a tube that drains bile from the liver into the small intestine. Right here where the bile duct enters the small intestine is called the ampulla of water. And what you see are two tubes that basically converge like two roads going into a highway. You have the bile duct and you also have the pancreatic duct which comes out here and basically drains the pancreas because you also need pancreatic enzymes to digest your food. So once they've been like triturated and broken down in the stomach, they come to the small intestine and not only do you dump bile to digest fats, you dump pancreatic enzymes to help digest the food, right? So those two ducts come in right here at the ampulla of water, also called the papilla, which is like a little mound you'll see, a tiny little mound you'll see in the small intestine, so you'll know it's there. The common bile duct is here, and then you have another duct that comes off of it called the cystic duct, which goes to the gallbladder, um, which, you know, is, is the holder of bile. And in some patients, you have bile gallbladder stones or gallstones that form inside this little sac. And it's known as a vestigial organ because you can live without it. So once you have the cystic duct take off to the gallbladder, the common bile duct up here turns into the common hepatic duct. This is a very short common hepatic duct because this picture is just trying to stay out of the way of the, of the small intestine, but right up here is a common hepatic duct, which then branches off into the left and right hepatic ducts. Okay, so those are basically the two, the intrahepatic ducts. And what they're not showing here is a big triangle called the liver. And the liver is what forms a bile and then all of it drains and sits here and drains out here. Now, one of the main things that I mentioned I do is stone disease. So if a stone is in the gallbladder and a patient's asymptomatic, you don't do anything about it. If the stone starts to come up here and basically whenever a patient, let's say has a fatty meal and the gallbladder is like, oh, I've got to supply bile to the small intestine and a stone is sitting right here and intermittently coming in and ca causing us like a mini obstruction, but then falling back out, that's called biliary colic. And that happens in 20% of people who have stone disease as is written here. And what you do for that is you take out their gallbladder. When a stone comes up and gets actually stuck inside the cystic duct uh, right here, that's number three, that can actually cause this whole sac to become inflamed, dilated, and infected. And that's called acute cholecystitis. And that also is in, usually urgent and the gallbladder needs to come out. If a stone falls here right at the takeoff of the cystic duct, but it doesn't actually fall into the bile duct, just the cystic duct, it can actually, if it's large enough, cause compression of this bile duct and make it seem like it's obstructed. And that's actually called Maritzi syndrome. It's pretty rare. When a stone falls into the common bile duct, that's called cholidocolithiasis. And I have a slide that I'm gonna show you later, which lists all these things and actually says the names. Um, and when a stone is stuck in here, just on its own, it's called cholidocolithiasis. If the stone is stuck in here and you have a super infection, meaning some dirty contents from the GI tract, 
touch that stone and then an, you have an ascending infection in this area, which should be sterile, that's called cholangitis. And cholangitis is an actual emergency. And those are the procedures that I have to go in the middle of the night to go and take the stones out. So anything dealing with the gallbladder is usually surgeon territory. Anything dealing with the bile ducts is my territory. And I have a special scope that reaches here and it's kind of a side viewing scope and goes up here and takes these stones out from this bile duct. And that is called an ERCP. All right, so I just wanna talk about ascending cholangitis and I'm gonna talk about ERCP as well. I have so much to talk about. So ascending cholangitis is that infection I told you about. So you have a stone that's stuck in the bile duct, which is cholodocolithiasis plus an infection. And that, be, that is by definition cholangitis. So cholangitis has a few components. You have an obstruction to the bile flow, usually because of the stone, bile stasis, again, it can't move. And then you have bacterial superinfection of the stagnant bile. So anywhere in the body, when you have a foreign body, in this case, a stone in the bile duct, those can be nidus for infection, whether it's a prosthesis, like a hip, hip replacement or knee replacement, those things unfortunately are niduses for infection. So in this case, it's a stone and it can cause early bacteremia. And in medical school, we learned about Charcot's triad and Reynolds pentad. And those are all the definitions of ascending cholangitis. Charcot's triad is when you have fever, right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. And Reynolds pentad is when you have hypotension and mental confusion as well. And that suggests that you have gram negative sepsis. So dirty bug from the GI tract got into the sterile uh, biliary tree and basically is causing sepsis or bacteremia. And if left untreated, this can cause hepatic abscesses if it rises all the way up into, into the liver and actually death in older people. All right, someone asked a question. Can acute cholecystitis cause a gallbladder to rupture if not taken care of? Absolutely, yes, it can. What causes stone disease? So it, there's a genetic component. Um, a largely genetic component, actually. There's a population of Native, Native Americans called the Pima Indians, where I think 80 to 90% of the population has gallstone disease. And that being said, not all people who have gallstones are symptomatic. A large proportion of them aren't, but if they are symptomatic, then they need an intervention. So it's mostly genetic. What are the effects of having your gallbladder removed? If it's a safe and uneventful procedure, there are no side effects whatsoever. You shouldn't really experience any symptoms from having your gallbladder out. Okay, so in terms of a treatment summary of the things we talked about, biliary colic is when you have the stone just intermittently coming into the cystic duct and causing pain, usually after a fatty meal. And that's what they love to ask on test questions. When someone has that, they have a non-urgent cholecystectomy, meaning their gallbladder removed at, as usually as an outpatient at like whenever they feel like having the surgery, it's not an urgent or emergent thing. Acute cholecystitis is when the stone gets stuck in the cystic duct and then the gallbladder becomes inflamed and infected and that patient needs more of an urgent cholecystectomy. And they usually come in with right upper quadrant pain, fever, and Murphy sign, which you also learned about in medical school. Cholodocolithiasis, as we just learned, is just when you have a stone in the common bile duct and you do not have a super infection. And so with that, what you usually do is take that stone out with an ERCP, which is my procedure that I'm gonna to describe to you in just a minute. And the patient at some point should have their gallbladder out because the gallbladder is where those stones were sitting. And that's why they had the opportunity to fall into the common bile duct. And then cholangitis needs an urgent ERCP as soon as possible, or some sort of decompression of the bile duct um, and antibiotics. And then at some point down the road, they need to have their gallbladder out so they don't have this issue again. All right, so I've talked a lot about ERCP. What is What exactly is ERCP? ERCP is an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, and I have to admit it's one of my favorite procedures to do. So what I do is I take a scope that is a little thicker than the upper endoscope. It's flexible, but it's side viewing. So going down, it's not as nice of a visualization as a forward viewing endoscope. And I basically go into the esophagus through the stomach, and then I come to the second part of the small intestine. And the benefit of having a side viewing scope is instead of looking down here, it's looking over here. It's looking for the papilla. The papilla is a tiny little mound, like I mentioned, with a few, two openings, one into the bile duct and one into the pancreatic duct. And these are like millimeter openings, usually like one to two millimeters. They are tiny. So when I describe to people what I do with ERCP, I'm like, I am basically aiming to get into a hole that's one to two millimeters with a scope that's like a few feet long using dials and just like maneuvers that I've learned with training. Um, 
Um, it's a very technically difficult procedure and a lot can go wrong. But again, if you can take these stones out for these patients and they don't have to have, you know, what they historically had to, which was like surgeries or drains through their bellies, it's, it's really quite an amazing procedure. So you go into the second part of the small intestine, you basically approach the ampulla, papilla, whatever you want to call it. And you essentially are trying to get your tools up into the bile duct. And the whole time you have to try your best to avoid getting into the pancreatic duct because the pancreas hates when you intervene or put stuff into the pancreatic duct. And so one of the big risks of ERCP is post ERCP pancreatitis for this very reason, because these two openings are just like essentially on top of each other. And it's very easy, especially if you don't use the right tricks and tools in your tool belt to get into the pancreatic duct. In fact, it's easier to get into the pancreatic duct than it is to get into the bile duct. And so whenever we're training fellows, usually when they start training to learn ERCPs, they almost always go into the pancreatic duct first. So you go up into the pancreatic, uh, the bile duct, and you basically use different things to pull that stone out. And you're doing it under live x-ray because, um, the bile duct itself is so small. You can get a scope into it, which is another procedure I do, but you only do that for specialized cases when you really need to see inside. Otherwise you do it under fluoroscopy, which is live x-ray. So you get your scope to the second portion of the duodenum, you get your tools into the bile duct, and then you can do things like here, they injected contrast. This is not my cholangiogram, which is the x-ray of the bile duct, but someone else's. They injected contrast to look all around. And then here you can see that the, the doctor injected contrast and got into the cystic duct and is feeding the gallbladder, which is full of stones here. It looks like a gumball machine. So this is a big fat cholangiogram um, where you can see the whole entire biliary tree. So you have your common bile duct, cystic duct, then it goes into the common hepatic duct, and then you have your right intrahepatic duct and left intrahepatic duct. And here you can faintly make out the shadow of the liver right there, and then some ribs. All right, so ERCP again, you're using these tiny millimeter tools to get into that pinhole in the second part of the small intestine. Again, it's a very hard procedure, but it's really worth it. Um, things that I do when I'm doing ERCP, I get stones out, which is like probably the most common thing. Other things are strictures that I have to stent. So this patient had a, um, a gall, um, bile duct cancer, which is called cholangiocarcinoma, and it was obstructing the person's bile duct. So I had to put a metal stent in to basically open up that obstruction and allow their bile to drain. And you can see how tight it is here. This is called the waist of my metal stent. Um, and then this is what the stent looks like in the small intestine draining like a ton of bile because this bile had been sitting up there for so long and the obstruction had caused the bilirubin to be so high. So once you release that, um, a, like basically Niagara Falls of bile comes out. And then here you can see, you know, a cholangiogram that while I'm doing an ERCP. Okay. So this is what a normal cholangiogram looks like. This is not my cholangiogram, this is someone else's. And I feel sad that they injected contrast into the pancreatic duct um, because it's not good for the pancreas, but it's not my cholangiogram, <laughs> full disclosure. So this is a normal bile duct. Um, you can see it's, it's skinnier than the scopes, you know that it's not really that dilated. And then you have the intrahepatic ducts, which looks like a Medusa head. Um, this is what the normal ampulla looks like. Again, tiny little pin, pin, like pinhole opening, which is right there. And that's what you're trying to get into. And they're, they're really, really quite small, cute little things. Um, once you get in, you have to cut this muscle so that stones and other things can come out. And that's called a sphincterotomy. And you use your sphincter tome, which is a specialized tool that has this cutting wire at the end to basically cut all the way up there. And that's what it looks like at the end. Um, it can be really juicy and a little beefy like it looks here and look like it's going to ooze where it looks fine. Um, someone asked, how does a body store bile without a gallbladder? You just basically dump it into the small intestine and it's okay. Um, the, gall, the gallbladder offers the benefit of basically contracting when you eat food and especially for fatty meals. So it gives that little oomph of bile, but people who don't have gallbladders digest food just fine and it's not an issue whatsoever. The body basically adjusts to that. So it's really quite a beautiful thing. All right, um, next. So another picture of a cholangiogram, this is your duodenoscope, side viewing scope. You come in, you have your common bile duct and there's someone's, there's a tool in there. You have your cystic duct stumped and clips. This patient had their gallbladder removed. You can tell that they had that surgery because you see clips there. And then you have the intrahepatic bile ducts, which again, look like a beautiful Medusa head. Here is a cholangiogram, again, the bile duct. And then you can see the contrast went into the gallbladder and there's a lot of stones there. 
This is what cholecholecholithiasis looks like. And just recall, I just went over the definition, but some of these words are a little annoying and take some time and practice to really get the hang of. Cholecholecholithiasis, recall, is just when you have stones in your bile duct without an infection. And when you inject contrast and look under live x-ray at your cholangiogram, you can see these filling defects, these like little circles here. And that's what cholecholecholithiasis looks like. And this patient has not only a very dilated duct because it's bigger than the scope, which is about 12 to 13 millimeters. So this is probably like 15 plus millimeters. So it's very dilated, but you can see all these filling defects. So that's going to be hard to get all those stones out. All right, so when I take a stone out, this is what it looks like. I have cannulated the bile duct and you basically take a tool, like a balloon, for example, you put the catheter in and you inflate the balloon above the stone and you basically drag it out. Um, you can also use a basket to do that. And stones can be different colors. They can be yellow cholesterol stones. They can be black pigmented stones or they can be brown pigmented stones. And uh, black pig pigmented stones usually suggest an issue with hemolysis and brown pigmented stones usually suggest uh, chronic infections. And if you go into GI, that's something that they actually like to test you on. But yellow stones are the most common and those are cholesterol stones. Okay, so that's enough about your CP. We can talk more about it later if you guys have more questions, but I mentioned too, I also do complex polypectomy. So in the colon, you can see polyps of all shapes and sizes. I was just doing colonoscopies all afternoon and I took out a bunch of small polyps. So when I'm doing um, advanced endoscopy uh, procedures and I'm taking out big polyps, it's because the patients who have these will develop cancer if they're not removed. So it's very important that you remove these precancerous polyps. And the way you do that is by injecting like a gel-like lifting agent underneath until it really kind of blossoms. And then you use snares, which are attached to cautery to basically cut them out. So this huge polyp that has so many different like areas I took out in one piece and you can see that it's just a nice little flat, beautiful defect at the end that you don't even have to clip because you can see the blue dye that I injected. The um, lifting agent tells me that I didn't cut too deep. All right, and I also do bariatric endoscopy, as I mentioned, which is basically suturing within the stomach to make it smaller. You can also do suturing of post-surgical stomachs to basically recreate what they had done in surgery if it stretched out too much. And here's just a video of me suturing inside the stomach um, with my suturing device. And you can see it's, it's sort of like sewing essentially within the stomach. But here I did this to basically reduce the stomach size and it's really, it's really nice for the patients because you know, they may wake up with a little bit of tenderness or nausea. Sometimes they wake up with no symptoms whatsoever, but it's much less invasive than a surgery. And it's ideal um, sleeve ga gastroplasty specifically, which is this what, what's shown here, which is basically reducing the stomach size with sutures, is ideal for patients who aren't uh, heavy enough, uh, don't meet criteria to get a actual surgery, which is their BMI has to be usually above 35 or above 40, um, 35 with comorbidities or above 40. But if they have a BMI of like 30 to 35 and they have a comorbidity or like an issue like back pain due to weight, then they can be candidates for this procedure, which is really quite nice. Okay, I also do luminal stenting, like I mentioned, specifically for cancers and sometimes strictures. So here is a stent that I put in in uh, a patient and you can see that the lumen right here is, uh, I'm sorry, the waist of the stent is tight because that's where the tumor was basically causing compression. This is what it looks like endoscopically when you have an uncovered metal stent inside like a stricture, malignant stricture, all the little, what they're called interstices of this like webbed stent, all the tissue kind of comes through. And then I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of um, apple core lesions specifically pertaining to colon cancer, but this is what they mean by an apple core lesion. So you have the lumen of your colon here, and then you have tumor that's basically causing a stricture. And if you look at it on imaging, it looks very much like an apple core, like you have the top and bottom of an apple and there's the core, and that's what colon cancers look like. And that's those are the ones that you usually have to stent, especially if they're not surgical candidates or as a bridge to surgery. Um, I have one more question here. How does the body, okay, we answered that. How does the body store bile without a gallbladder? We talked about that. Since the sphincter is essentially cut, do some patients end up having a sphincter that doesn't fully recover, as in it might be leaky? No, that's not an issue whatsoever. And it's protective for those patients if they have stone disease so that another stone doesn't get stuck. There are no issues in patients who've had a sphincterotomy, which is what it's called to cut that sphincter. It's beneficial for them so they don't develop the 
risk of cholangitis, which is a life-threatening infection. So you need to make sure you eliminate that risk for them in the future. All right, and then someone else asked, what causes polyps? So polyps, unfortunately, are like genetic. They can also be a result of ongoing inflammation. And oh, hold on, I lost my chat box. It's okay, I'll answer the questions at the end. But to answer your question, polyps can be genetic. They can be a result of ongoing inflammation. So people who have, let's say, inflammatory bowel disease, um, ulcerative colitis, they have so much turnover of the cells because of the inflammation in their colon that they may be at increased risk for like pseudo polyps or other things and cancer additionally, because there's so much turnover. So you can, you're always at risk of having a um, mutation which causes unchecked growth. And that's essentially what cancer is. Okay. What are the complications associated with bariatric endoscopy? So it depends on the procedure. It also depends on your technical skill. There's a risk of bleeding. There's a risk of perforation because you're doing full thickness bites, the entire stomach. It's like a full thickness plication bite. And so you can always perforate. Um, thank God I've never had any of those complications, but knock on wood. Now that I mentioned that, who knows, maybe I, will. I really hope not. So, um, but another risk is that they may not lose as much weight as they would have had they had surgery. So, but they're really great procedures. All right, so I'm gonna switch, switch gears a little bit now that I talked about all the different procedures I did and talk a little bit about some of the other things I did while I was in medical school and residency, which is global health. So one of the things I'm gonna talk to you guys about, and I wanna make sure I'm okay with time, is doing something when you're applying to medical school or residency or fellowship that sets you apart. And ideally it will be something that you're passionate about so that it's not just like doing it for the resume. It's something that you really care about. So for me, that was global health. I absolutely love and am fascinated by healthcare, the way healthcare works in other countries. Um, in America, we very much have somewhat of a broken system where we focus, focus more on treating than we do prevention. So I was very fascinated to learn about what healthcare is like in other countries that we consider second or third world. So I went during medical school to work in India and I worked at a cancer hospital in South India and there I am and there are some of our friends from the Indian Cancer Center we worked at and I actually uh, got a scholarship and convinced two of my friends to apply. So the three of us went together to South India for four months while I was in medical school. And then um, we did research and publish, which was really awesome. And then when I was in residency, I had the amazing fortune of being able to work in Istanbul and Turkey for a couple of months as well. Um, and here's some pictures I took. These are the students that I was teaching. I was working at a private hospital, a very fancy med school where they had like an art gallery in their hospital and just like it was a hotel, like very, very fancy. And I taught those medical students cardiology. And then I worked at a, like a very much a city hospital that was very much serving the underserved. And I shadowed them in their hepatology clinic. So it was kind of like they paid for everything so that I could go work in the other clinic. Um, but the exchange was that I had to teach these students cardiology, which was really fun. And then I got to do some traveling while I was there. I went to Cappadocia and got to see the site. So it was just a really awesome experience for me. All right, research. So research is another thing that you have to do to set yourself apart. Even if you hate research, unfortunately, if you want to be in an academic institution, if you want to be competitive in an academic institution, not just for a medical school residency and fellowship, but also as an attending, you have to do research to set yourself apart. And again, ideally you will do you will do things that really interest you uh, or focus on research. But, you know, I think the name of the game when you're in medical school is you take the projects that you can get and just hope that they're interesting to you and that you have a good mentor or PI um, for the project, principal investigator. Um, the other thing I will say is that um, you may not know what you like and research is a great opportunity for you to learn about a new field as a medical student. So it's really just wonderful. So here's a project uh, paper I was the first author on and uh, got published in one of the biggest GI journals. Here's a book chapter I wrote and then just some other uh, research projects I've done. Um, another one of my favorite things is being a medical correspondent um, and basically working with medical media. I really, really enjoy communicating with people. One of the reasons why I'm working with web shadowers to talk to you guys, I have a passion for not only communicating, but also educating. And one of the ways I can do that is through medical media. So um, I have you know, been featured in many different media outlets and it's been really, really, really fun for me um, to do that. And I think I'm gonna just go through and answer these questions at the end if you guys are okay with that. Okay. 
Um, and here, you know, time, I'm talking about a cold virus curing bladder cancer. So I'm not a urologist, and some people might be like, why is a gastroenterologist talking about that? But I have my board certification in internal medicine and GI, so I just enjoy, you know, doing this. So it's really fun, and it's a great kind of like side gig to have and build on on top of clinical medicine. So it's really, really quite enjoyable. All right. Um, lastly is committee work. So whether you're a medical student, resident, fellow attending, it's very important if you want to continue in academic medicine to be involved with committee work. Um, there's organizations in every single field, like national and international organizations. For GI, it's the American College of Gastroenterology, the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and then the New York branch of that, NYSGE. So if you're in academics, it's very important, and private practice too. People like to be involved. It's great networking opportunity to do society work, and that is one of the key ways to become nationally recognized so that you can be a candidate for a promotion. So something they never teach you in medical school or in uh, residency, even even is once you're in attending, it doesn't end there. You're not just like done and you can like, you know, chill out. <laughs> you have to keep on essentially competing, not only for uh, recognition, but also for promotion. And one of the ways to do that is to do society work. All right. And then probably the bane of my existence, because I'm just so awful at it, is social media. <laughs> so I think in 2021, every doctor is on social media, every medical student is on, everybody's on social media. So I feel like you just have to join the game. So um, I had to as well, and I am so awful at it. And if any of you guys have advice for me, you know, in exchange for my teaching, you can help me with social media. I would be so happy to receive that advice. Um, so anyways, follow me. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Delatora. I also just joined Twitter like a month ago and have zero, like no followers uh, at Rabia Delatora. And I also have a website, so check it out. Um, and here is a picture of me. Everyone knows this guy and he's very nice. His name is Dr. Mike. He's like a super nice guy, but he's got like millions and millions of followers. And so I put this picture up there because, you know, I, I use this lecture for someone else and they were like, wow, Dr. Mike, he's like a celebrity. So <laughs> I'll share that. <laughs> Anyhow, Yes, follow me. All right, so now I just wanna share some tips during our last segment of how to basically make yourself competitive for residency fellowship, whatever it is. So I talked about this a little bit. Um, number one is to set yourself apart. Everybody's application, and I was on the admissions committee for my medical school. I interviewed for residency, and now I interview people for our fellowship. So I've seen people at all stages of the game, and I continue to be involved in, you know, recruitment and interviewing for our fellowship, which is really kind of fun and interesting to see what candidates are doing in, you know, 2021 as opposed to when I was applying. So one of the most important things is to set yourself apart. Everybody's application is going to have good grades. Everybody's application is going to have, you know, decent test scores, whether it's step one, step two, step three, if that's even, is step three CS even still a thing or CK, I can't remember. But it's just very important to do something to set yourself apart, whether that is research, whether that is global health, whether that is, you know, something you did, an organization you started, volunteer, an instrument, do something that makes you unique so that the person interviewing you has something to talk about with you during your interview, as opposed to just like, so you got good grades and you want to go into X field. Okay, great. It, it really makes you more interesting, more well-rounded. So start thinking about that now. It's never too early, whatever stage you guys are in, um, to do something like that. Because it's way more meaningful for me to interview someone who has an organization that they have been working with, like Habitat for Humanity, for the last five years, as opposed to the last five months, which very much feels like they wretchedly tried to fit some volunteer work into their application because you know, they knew they were applying for something. So it just seems a little bit more genuine when there's like a real time commitment stamp on your application. Number two, you guys will hear a lot about work-life balance, especially nowadays. It's like very on brand to talk about this, but it's super important. Um, you have to make time for what matters. Uh, I have two kids and I, and a husband, and, you know, I make more time for my kids than like most of my colleagues because they're the most important thing to the world in the world to me. And I know that when I'm like retiring or even to be more, you know, 
morbid on my deathbed. When I look back, I won't be like, I wish I had worked more. No, I'll say, I wish I had spent more time with my kids and invested more in them, especially when they're young. So make sure you make time for what matters. When I was in medical school, I had an anatomy quiz, which like means nothing, but I, it was like the end of the world for me. I had an anatomy quiz the next day. And one of my like oldest friends was like, I'm going to be in New York city for, you know, a few hours. Can you come and see me? And I was like, no, I can't. I have this anatomy quiz and I didn't see him. And honestly, after a long time, like we lost touch. And I just feel like study for the anatomy quiz, but like, don't cut out all of your friends and family in the process because medical school and work are not everything. And it's very important to maintain your sanity, to make sure you have balance. And obviously it's easier said than done, but everyone, you have to find your own way to do, accomplish that um, in any way that works for you. But it's just very important um, another thing that I want to talk about medical medicine in general just has a lot of growing to do. So medical school is still 50, 50 in terms of male, female breakdown, gastroenterology fellowship is way worse. It's 30% female and 70% male. And the thought process behind that is that people believe that women are more hesitant to do additional training because they want to start families and they feel like, you know, doing a subspecialty where they have to take call would be harder if they want to do have a family. I would discourage you from letting that define what field you enter ever, because no matter what, if you love a field, go for it. Do not think to yourself like, no, I won't be able to do this because I want to have a family, whether you're a man, a woman, or, you know, whatever you want to do, you should pursue it, please. Like, do not let that be something that stops you because then you'll live with regret. And I mean, I'm an advanced endoscopist in one of the most notorious fields, which is literally like 13% female in the last match. Um, in 2019, nine out of 70 people were female. And, you know, it's just not true that you cannot have a family and do this as a woman. So just never let that kind of be your rate limiting, you know, steps. It's just very important to know that you can do it all. You just need to find balance and know that it is possible and have supportive leaders that help you within your institution who support you to accomplish your goals. Um, and I also very, very strongly feel that representation matters. So, you know, 10 years ago, there weren't that many women in advanced endoscopy. And had I been training at that time, perhaps I wouldn't have thought that I could do it. And hopefully, you know, people at my institution see that I'm doing it and that more women are encouraged to go into it. So it's just very important representation matters so much because if you see nobody like you doing something, you won't think that you can do it. And the truth is you can, you can do anything. All right. In that same vein, mentorship is extremely important, no matter where you want to go in life, whether it is in any field, not just medicine. It's very important. You have to find an effective mentor, not just someone who says, yeah, sure, I'll mentor you. And they're like a big name. You have to find an effective mentor. Perhaps you've mentored other people and they've had success or somebody you just naturally gel with that you've worked with that you feel could help you. Um, it's not just about, again, having like a warm body who basically says like, sure, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. It's like somebody who's going to actually invest in you in your future after you have proven your worth to them. So it's not normal to meet somebody and work with them for like two days and then say, will you be my mentor? No, you have to basically work with them for at least, you know, a couple of weeks, if not more, maybe ask to do a research project with them, show them that you're serious. And then afterwards you can say, I'd really be interested in having you help me more and, you know, help me progress through whatever it is you're trying to achieve, whether it's getting into residency fellowship or even as an attending, it's important to have mentors. Um, the most important thing about mentorship though is it's very easy to fall into like the rabbit hole of asking for more and more and more projects and saying oh my mentor is working on this maybe i should work on this with them but the worst thing you can do is say yes i'll work on this project and i'll collect data for you and then not finish it or say i'm too overwhelmed and by that point they've already kind of depended on you for a few months i'm telling you this because i've done this and people will be very angry with you. Um, but you know, it's hard. You wanna be like a yes man as a trainee, right? And just keep on saying, yes, 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 I'll do it. So just be careful to not do that. You know, Learn from my mistakes and make sure that you know what your limits are and don't bite off more than you can chew. Next, pick your field for the right reasons. Pick something that you genuinely enjoy, not because you think it will look good on paper. 
don't go into, you know, plastic surgery because you think it's like a fancy field. Do it because you genuinely love the field and what they do. If you don't enjoy doing hands-on work, but you think that plastic surgery is like really sexy, then you're not going to be happy. So I think that it's important that you know yourself, which is something that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Next, know yourself to know what you like and don't like. Know what you're good at and be honest with yourself. And you should start thinking about that now to really kind of know what the best field will be for you. So I'm going to just read this slide because I want to make sure I hit all my points. It's easy to go through life just going from point to point. But along the way, it's important to try to get to know yourself. Like, what do you like? Are you amazing at fixing things and working with your hands? Or are you terrible? Are you very clumsy and a klutz and constantly dropping things and dropping your phone and just like literally tripping all the time? You know, if you're in the latter category, perhaps it's not wise to go into a procedure-based field where you have to work with your hands because you're going to, I'm, I'm not saying this is true for everyone because there are some people who can train themselves to like be better and whatnot. But if that's how you've been your whole life and you are pushing against what is natural for you just because you feel like that's what you should do, it will result in a lack of happiness down the road. So it's important for you to know yourself, know what you like, know also what your fortes are and try to find a field that is like a natural inclination in that sense. Um, you know, if you're really good at problem solving and you're going into a field where, like I mentioned, like chronic illnesses that have no solution. And like, I'll talk about myself, for example, I would never, ever, ever be good at rheumatology or neurology where so many of the disease processes they're treating are chronic illnesses without a surefire cure. Uh, I would have a very hard time with that. And I know myself enough to know that I wouldn't be happy. I would be really depressed for my patients. I don't think I could watch someone struggle through something where there's no cure, like, you know, MS, multiple sclerosis. It would be very hard for me. And I think it would wear on my soul. So that wouldn't be a right field for me. And I know myself enough to know that. So it's important for you to know yourself and try to find fields. And if you're not sure, you should talk to people in that field and say, like, I'm good at X, Y, and Z. Do you think this would be the right field for me? All right, foster relationships at every step. So this is a picture at my wedding with all my friends from medical school, more friends from medical school. These are my friends from residency. Like you never know when you're going to need help and you never know when your family member might be admitted to a hospital in another city and you need to you know, get some information. Like very important to foster relationships at every step. These people who are going through it with you it is probably the best time in your life to form your best friendships um, because there's no struggle like going through medical school together and residency together and fellowship together if that's your path. It's, it's really kind of such like a unique thing that we do as adults who are like still not fully adults kind of. So it's just, you'll meet some of your best friends in training and just really embrace that. While again, in the same vein, network. So make sure you organically network. Um, it's very awkward when someone meets you on like Facebook or Instagram and you know, they don't know you and maybe you've interacted and then they're like, can you give me an interview? And you're like, I, I, we haven't really worked together. Like networking should be organic. If you meet someone who is an inspiration to you, perhaps you can ask them how you can help them in some capacity, especially if you're at the same institution. Like, do you have any research projects that can be involved with? Um, you know, like, for example, the amazing, like, people who are setting up these web shadow programs reached out to doctors, and that is an awesome way to network because, uh, you're asking me to present and I enjoy presenting and I love talking to students. So this is like a great opportunity for us to connect and network with each other. So that's like, you know, an example of organic networking that's not forced. And people always remember when you worked hard for them and they'll never forget when you didn't. So make sure that even if you're working with someone that you never, you don't think that you'll ever need to like impress that you work your tail off because you don't know who they know. And networking is like the most important thing you can do, especially if you want to stay at the institution where you trained. Um, so as someone who stayed not only for residency fellowship, advanced fellowship, and now as an attending, networking is very important because I formed solid relationships with the people I was working for. So they hired me to work for them as an attending. All right, tip number eight, follow through on your promises. I'm gonna say the same things over and over again. If you sign up for a project, finish it. I have quit on projects and people like really, I there are people I see in the hospital where I work, where I trained who like avoid eye contact with me because I quit on their projects because I wanted to be a cardiologist and I had like, 
you know, wasn't, didn't know I wanted to be GI. I signed up for all these cardiology projects when I was a resident and then decided, oh no, I want to do GI. And I, I really just emailed them and I was like, I'm so sorry. I don't think I can continue. And now when I see them, they're like, oh my God, that girl. So it's not because I'm a bad person, but you know, I probably should have just finished those projects. So try not to do what I did. If you volunteer for an organization, commitments, like I mentioned earlier, should be at least a year to look really uh, effective. If they're really short-term commitments, maybe don't even put them on your CV. Like I saw someone who put like alternative spring break on their CV and that's like a five-day commitment. And it just, it doesn't seem, you can put it on there, but you know, not as like the coup de grace, like the big thing that you did, you know, that's my volunteerism um, because it just, it's not long enough. Um, and don't say yes, unless you plan to follow through, be realistic with yourself, your availability, your availability, and also your drive to, com to commit and whether or not you want to finish these things. And the worst thing you can do, like I said before, is to say yes and burn bridges because people sadly do not forget that. And then tip number nine, share your experiences. If you have had life adversity and you're applying for a, uh, you know, the next step, medical school residency fellowship, Honestly, it's very important to share those if you feel comfortable. No one's saying you have to, but you know there are things that we all as humans encounter. And when you walk down the street, you never know what someone's going through. Same thing with interviews. You never know why someone may have had that one off year in undergrad. Perhaps they were going through something very severe. I had a horrible year in undergrad at Cornell as a sophomore. And my I was dealing with some like really serious family stuff and it reflected. And I regret not sharing that on my application because I think it hurt me because people just didn't know like why this step, like what happened that year. And maybe I should have shared that. So I will say when I interview people and they have like a story that really humanizes them, it it makes a huge difference and you want to fight for that person and like protect them and advocate for them. So if you have something that happened to you, you know, that impacted school and you're comfortable sharing that in your application, like incorporate it into your personal statement or your essay. Um, because again, it makes you human. And I think that just makes us all more relatable. All right. So just on a final note, before I answer some of your questions and take additional ones, just Rumi said it best, what you seek is also seeking you. So make sure that you find what kind of will fulfill you career-wise because career takes up so many hours of our lives. It's important for us to be happy while we're doing it. And then a quote that I made up that people at my institution absolutely love is, I may never be a household name, but I will be a big name in my household. And those are words that I live by because it just reminds me all the time what my priorities are. Um, my family and my patients. And so if I feel like I am balancing both and make, making both a priority, then I know that I'm happy. All right, guys, now I'm going to answer your questions. And I just really want to thank you for listening in and um, do me a solid and follow me because I have like no followers and I would really appreciate that. <laughs> and that is the end. Okay. So let me answer some of your questions. Okay. So we answered what causes polyps? What are the complications associated with bariatric endoscopy? We talked about that. How did you come across the opportunity to study in India? So my medical school had a scholarship called the Barry Collar Scholarship. He was a doctor who worked at Stony Brook and had created a medication and had royalties from that medication. And so he basically donated money to this. You can research other like global health opportunities. A lot of places have them. You just have to do the research to find it and see if that would be an option for you. My residency also luckily had a global health elective and they um, had some stipends from the school as long as I taught those students. So it was really awesome for me that that happened. Um, so yes, I would talk to, you know, the advisor at your school and see if there are, whether it's, you know, undergrad study abroad or something of the kind, a lot of medical schools have them and they may not be like heavily advertised, but it's, it's important to research it. And if they don't, maybe you can create one and ask if they have any connections at other hospitals and they can create a program because that happens all the time too. Maybe not now with COVID, but you know, um, hopefully the world returns to normal soon. We can do that again. All right, next question. Is it normal slash can you easily find opportunities abroad during med school? All right, just answered that question. So if you guys have more questions on that, I can talk about that again later, but I think I answered it for the most part. 
Next question, when did you start doing research, pre-med or during med school? So my first research project was as, as an undergrad at Cornell. And the reason why I keep on telling you guys not to drop the ball on research projects is because as an undergrad, I did. I signed up for bench research because I thought that that would be the best thing for my application. My heart was not in it. They wanted me to kill mice and they wanted me to like basically do all these like P53 mutation analysis and like PCR. And I literally hated it. I hated it so much that I would go and sit there and I was an undergrad. I was tired. I would literally sit there and like fall asleep on the desk and they would be like, what is wrong with this girl? She is a mess. Like, I think they really must have just thought I was a disaster. And I, I swear I'm not a disaster. Like literally look, look how far I've come. So it's important to know that, you know, don't do things that you are absolutely going to hate, but it was learning lesson for me. So that's good. All right, so I started then, I did research in uh, India and got a publication out of it. So that was in medical school. And then I've continued to do research since and I have a lot of publications and a lot of poster presentations. Um, okay, next, did you decide to go into GI before your internal medicine residency? No, I decided very late. I was going to be a cardiologist. I was like hell bent on it. And I decided like shortly before my, um, my our match, our application cycle that I needed to do GI and I like very rushedly did like four projects and they all got accepted to our national conferences as posters and then networked like the living daylights out of the GI people at my program and around New York City and so it was really, 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 really fortuitous but it took a lot of hard work. All right, next question. What does a typical day of work look like for you? Okay, I'm all clinical. I go to the hospital in the morning and I scope all day long. Um, one half day a week, I supervise clinic for fellows, but I do those procedures I described to you all day long and I absolutely love it Monday through Friday. So it's really, really awesome for me. So that is, again, I found a job that is perfect for me. I don't spend that much. I don't really spend any time in an office. I do procedures and help people all day long. So it's perfect. You mentioned doing medical school at Stony Brook. What made you choose Stony Brook and what would you say makes it stand out? So I'll be honest with you guys. I didn't get into that many medical schools. I had a really good step um, MCAT score and I had a really good GPA. I had a 3.7 coming from Cornell, but for whatever reason, maybe it's because sophomore year I did so badly and I was a very generic candidate. I didn't have a lot that set me apart at that point in my life. I got into only a handful and Stony Brook for me was state tuition and I'm from New York state. So that was one of the main appealing things for me. It's also a very good school. It's one of the top SUNY schools. It's not Harvard and you know, that's okay. It gave me a beautiful foundation and got me to where I am today. So I'm like forever appreciative. So again, you don't have to go to Harvard. Maybe I would have been miserable there, but I'm just saying I didn't get in. So, <laughs> all right. Does anyone else have any other questions? Okay, is virtual research literature review significant enough to put on a medical school application? Absolutely. Any research you do, whether it's a lit review, whether it's a case series, anything you do, especially as a medical student, is like amazing. Obviously, uh, we see some medical students who've worked in a lab since high school and they have all this research. That wasn't me. So trust me, I, I think a lot of the people who are interviewing aren't as intimidating as you think. We all went through the process and we know it can be hard. Um, what I wouldn't do is say like, I don't have any research because of COVID because I think you can still do like, you know, literature reviews and other things. Despite that, it's just about finding a good mentor. All right, next question. What would you say is a generic med school applicant? Uh, me, I had a good test, I had good test scores. I had a good GPA and I didn't have any research or any extracurriculars that made me unique. I was like so standard. And again, I mentioned earlier, do something that sets you apart. I didn't really have anything that set me apart. I had things from high school, but it's like, what? It's like, girl, what were you doing during four years of undergrad? Just like having fun. But I was studying. <laughs> I didn't think, nor did I have the mentorship to do anything that was unique. You know, I didn't have much volunteer work. I had done a few, I had done an alternative spring break, which I put on my CV, which is why I'm telling you not to do that. <laughs> and I didn't have that much else. So that's what I mean. I mean me, don't be me. <laughs> Be better than me. All right, next question. What do you think are important things to consider when choosing medical school to go to apply? So I will say all medical schools, um, the curriculum is pretty standard. 
people, some people like fangirl over the name. And obviously if you go to a good name school, it may help you get into, you know, better residency, but medical school, I don't think we should be like clout chasers for medical school, like the way we are. I think nowadays things have changed because some of the med schools are free tuition like NYU. So that would be like oh my God, if I was applying, I would die to go to NYU for free tuition. That's a big game changer because student debt is, you know, monstrous and it's just really, really difficult, especially for medical school. It's so expensive these days. That's, I would say, um, find a place that has a good track record of matching people well. You can always look at where people have matched from medical school and see if that is helpful. But to be completely honest with you, um, for me and for a lot of my friends, it wasn't so much like we had the luxury of choosing. We were kind of like, I'll go wherever I get in. And that's a sad reality of a lot of it. There are going to be a percentage of people who have that luxury of choosing, but for a lot of us, it's like, go where you get in and that's okay. Just get in where you get in. And then, you know, you can figure out what you want to choose when you have the option of choosing your subspecialty or specialty. All right, next question is, is mental health and adversity you should share if it was a factor in your grades dropping? That is a very good question. And I would, I would be careful about how much you expose about your mental health struggles if you feel like it will make you too vulnerable in an ongoing way. Now, mental health is you know, obviously extremely important and it's important for trainees particularly, but if you expose something about yourself that may make the person interviewing you concerned that it may be an ongoing issue, then I probably would not share that unless it was triggered by an event. Let's say, let's say you went through like family trauma or parents got divorced or, you know, like something happened, like I'll tell you guys, um, my younger brother is applying for residency and he got COVID and he got very sick and that was very hard. And that's something he shared in his application. And, you know, a lot of people were very empathetic towards him for that, for sharing that. Um, so that's an example of something that, that I think is appropriate to share. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, any advice for imposter syndrome? Everybody has it. And if they say they don't have it, they're lying. I have imposter syndrome all the time. It takes a few years for you to really get into the groove of what you're doing and really feel, you know, secure and confident. But I hope that for everyone's sake that you all get there because once you do, it's really quite glorious. But, you know, all the time, everybody gets imposter syndrome. It's very normal. Um, just accept it and know that it's natural and normal. Okay, I don't see any more questions. I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Dr. Delator, for such a wonderful presentation. It was so informative. And thank you for taking the time to answer all of our questions. We really, really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. For, for everyone still watching, the Google form has been posted in the chat box and will be posted in the description of this video shortly. And you'll have 30 minutes from now to fill that out. And once again, thank you so, so much, Dr. Delator.